Welcome to Kevin Richards VIPs. This week's guest is an amazing man with a true passion for art and his family. You may not know him around here, but the rest of the world sure does. This week we get to know the artist, John Newton. So I'm sitting here in the studio of John Newton. You may not know John Newton, but you may know him as J.R. Newton. And if you don't know him, it's because he's this wonderful, quiet artist here in the city of Barrie. And I can't wait to talk about him. John, I'm really glad you're on the show finally. This is so cool to sit down and talk to you because honestly, I, when I met you, I remember walking into a room where you had your studio. And I guess that's just the art thing. When you see that, that art that you just makes you melt. Remember, it was your job. That's right. And I saw that, and I honestly got emotional within seconds of seeing this picture, whether it reflected my life or what it was. But you have this incredible ability as an artist, so it's about time people get to know you in town here. So tell me, why are we in here? What's, what's going on in your studio right now? We'll take a look around, and we've got this piece behind you. Yeah, I have all these works kind of. These paintings are in progress right now. This is a, a narrative piece I've been working on for the last couple of years. It's a difficult piece, but it's a piece that's just gonna run in for, for the next few years. Just, uh, and then the other ones I have uh, completed all throughout the studio. And this is just the workshop. This is where all the paintings are done and where I pump things out. <laughs> well, you say pump them out, and it's funny because two years isn't pumping it out, but it kind of is in yeah. the world of real art. And that's the difference between people picking up something, and you've said it eloquently earlier when we were talking off camera about the difference between picking up a print at Walmart or having something that's a true original. And, you know, I look at pieces like this and I just think it's so reflective of you. And, you know, today people get to know why that's so reflective of you. So let's sort of unpack this in a minute, but sure. let's get to know you as to where you're from. Where'd you grow up? I grew up in Orangeville. Orangeville's a small town. Mm -hmm. um, not a lot of painting uh, to be done in there. It's a really small town. To, uh, I remember I picked up my first book at one of the little stores down there, and then I just got hooked. I saw this Michelangelo drawing, and then I just wanted to do a reproduction of it. Mm -hmm. And then uh, my mother told me I used to draw when I was a little kid. She would come in the room, and there'd be like a million little zeros. She said, from floor to ceiling, I would just be drawing circles. And then uh, if you look through history, that's how they used to just practice even just drawing, just practice doing circles, just to kind of get the movement with your fingers and drawing and an accuracy. Creating you know, like a sort of a, the repetitiveness and yeah. creating, creating that pattern. Yeah, and then uh, when I got hooked on oil, um, I remember there was a painter named Frank Frazetta. He used to do like Conan and things like that. And I fell in love with it. And I tried to do a repro. And actually, it was funny. The first repro I did, I think, when I was 16. And I sold it to the bar in Orangeville to the owner. And then, uh, and then while I was in school, um, high school, my favorite art teacher, Mr. Cook, he got me into doing a, and it's still there, the, there was a mural done. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember it was basically, I, I spent half a year working on that mural. That was my big, uh, my big thing. Imagine a mural painted by you. Like that's kind of the funny thing, is a mural painted by a bunch of kids it's in art there. class, yeah. and they just kind of throw it up and you're like, oh, that's nice. Oh, it was great. I got paid to be out of class. So they even paid for the, for the project and I got to keep all the paints, which was wicked. And it was kind of my intro going into into, uh, into college. And then so my, tell me about that. So then you decided you were going to go to college. What was your inspiration for that? And, and what, you know, how did you pioneer or, or decide where you wanted to go with that? Cause I, I didn't, I was a bohemian, like I didn't care. And then uh, I remember my dad pretty much wanted me to kind of look for what, I, you know, just to kind of get out of the house. And then he said, why don't you look into the Ontario College of Art? I think he had some friends at work who went to, went to the school mm -hmm. and then I signed up and going down to Toronto I found my world I found where I belonged meeting different artists it's, it's funny because my, my type of work is classical realism going into an abstract school mm -hmm. was difficult so you kind of bang heads with other students on this is art or this isn't art and uh, I kind of just found my my thing down there so around when was that what year roughly uh, geez really late, late 80s uh, well, maybe 90s yeah yeah so you're looking at a time when there's a grunge scene and people are drawing yeah, that's like right. unhappy albums. Yeah, I had, long, I had really long hair, so I, I thought it was cool. People are drawing album covers back uh, then. Yeah. Yeah, so art's a whole different world, especially in Toronto. Yeah. You know, Toronto being Canada is definitely, it's Canada's art, art city that is just so different than Montreal and other yeah. cities around. So. Yeah, it was busy. It was, it was awesome to see. It was just a matter of, like, like I said, coming from a small town, there's really nothing to offer that way for the arts. There's small people who are doing wildlife art and things like that, but what I wanted was a different avenue and uh, looking for this thing called classical realism, studying the Renaissance. Um, there was a gallery owner at the time who 
knew what I was doing, so he said, why don't you just paint what you want to paint, and I'll give you a shot at the gallery. And mm -hmm. lo and behold, I started kind of selling through there, and then I met uh, a friend of mine. Well, he was, he, I saw his uh, Winston Churchill that you saw in the other yeah, room, yeah. and I said, I want to go that avenue. And mm -hmm. uh, he took me under his wing for a few years, and he studied in Italy with a guy named uh, Michael John Angel, who was under uh, one of the last masters in Italy was Pietro Anagoni. And uh, so I have a lot of their secrets, little trade secrets. Well, that's cool. Because when you think about, you know, going to art school or even taking art in high school, especially in a smaller town like Orangeville, yeah. Barry at one time was very much similar to Orangeville, where, you know, you say you want to be an artist, and it's like, oh, well, shouldn't you be playing hockey? Or, or do you, I get the big one was, do you do tats? <laughs> so uh, they're doing tats or painting the hockey helmets and things like that, so, <laughs> which I did. Well, yeah. I had a little survived. business on the side, yeah. I, I was able to make a little bit of money on the side painting hockey helmets, like skulls and things like that. <laughs> <laughs> so you then progress out of OCA. Yeah. So how long was that and what, what was your first ambition after OCA? Um, well, to get out and actually have a career, which is fairly difficult getting into this business. So. If you don't have a, 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 a certain portfolio behind, it's very difficult to get into the industry. So I became a piano mover for a little while. Mm -hmm. And then I remember I went into this uh, beautiful home and there was artwork everywhere. And then uh, uh, I found out that he was an art dealer. So, and I said, can I bring my portfolio? And he said, sure, I'll look it over. So we went forward with him having a show in New York. He took some of the paintings down. And from there I stayed with uh, that company uh, for 15, 15 years. See, that's the funny thing is that fortunately Barry hasn't seen any of your shows really. No. They, they haven't been able to no. embrace what you're doing here because his passion is beautiful. But, you know, where, where would you say most of your shows are? Is it like New York and LA? Mainly everything was bought privately. I never really did a lot of shows because most of the stuff was already pre-ordered pre at the time. So they'll call me and say, we want this or we love this. And I would send it out to Colorado or New York, um, mainly all throughout the States. And then ma my main stuff up here was painting for the churches. So I did uh, St. John Vianney, I did uh, the altar pieces, and then for the home, for Father Bijou. Um, another one was a, paint a painted saint in another Catholic church. I did a Byzantine cross, which was very difficult. It was just a lot of little iconic heads, mm -hmm. which uh, it took me a long time to paint. So when you say that, it's, you don't, I guess that's sort of the fun thing is people tell you to draw apples and you draw apples. You gotta draw yeah. a pear, you gotta draw a pear. Mm -hmm. You try and go with what's popular. Sure. How hard is that, having somebody tell you to draw something? Do you find sometimes that it's business is okay and business is business, or do you find sometimes you struggle with what people are asking you to paint? Yeah, like some things I'll just flat out say no. Like it's like, uh, I, I, I still- the clowns. It, yeah, it's still, yeah, like I had one <laughs> when they asked me because I was doing uh, for landscapes and then I think it was a, a dealer out of Colorado asking me to paint uh, cow heads with suits on and a uh, and really lucrative deal but uh, not for me it's not where i want to go because my name i back my i back what i paint and i love what i i really do love what i do mm -hmm. so when you think about your inspirations what are some of your inspirations because clearly there's a whole renaissance thing going yeah. on here too so what's your what's your real motivation there and what's your your passion from mine is storytelling like if it wasn't uh, for painting i would be making movies this way is the closest for me to make my movies and uh, most uh, filmmakers are huge art lovers because I have to tell a story. I only have one moment to give you an entire story. Mm -hmm. Usually with a movie, you got an hour and a half to present your story and an emotion and builds up. This is a one shot deal. Are they able to get it to the viewer to understand? And it would be my fault if you don't understand the painting. Well, I don't know if it's necessarily your fault because I think that when you go to the art gallery or you go to a big production and you see beautiful pieces of art, I've seen people walk into art galleries and or you know the AGO and they will stand there mm -hmm. and then they leave. Yeah. And then you'll see somebody it's else who is and somebody is standing there for an hour telling the story in their head and those are the people who get you or get your art or will have their own story in their head. Cuz sometimes you don't have to tell the story to everybody. It's up to them no. whether they want to read it. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, that's right. So when you're doing your art, where do you find your sources and your your you know your go for it? Like, where do you get your giddy up on that? Mine is the, even the, through my kids. My, my, uh, my daughter inspires me a lot, just her creativity. Um, it's amazing to watch a child. I find the older we get, the more rigid I become. 
So it's a matter of just kind of getting out of my own head and going in sometimes in the mind of a child. Mm -hmm. And just to hear some of the things she says. I remember working on a painting, and most painters, we, we never know when we're done. Like Leonardo said, a painting's never finished, it's only abandoned. It's just because you just want to keep working it. And I remember asking my daughter, she was working on a painting, and I'm like, well, she signed it. And I said, well, how do you know you're done? She said, because I said so. And I was like, wow, she's a better painter than I am. <laughs> like, just, she just, uh, she just, that's her work, and then she stands by it, that, and done. She was able to walk away. For me, I still go through the process of like, keep working it and working it. And that's just one of those things. Yeah, sometimes I think they say that, that, you know, that the joy of being an artist is knowing that it's done. Yeah, I, I, yeah, it, it is a fantastic feeling, especially when you do, you know, when you're able to sell it and people appreciate it. It's a great feeling. Like if, if I take a painting and then nobody wants it, 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 it can hurt. So it's a matter of like telling a story, I still need to be conscientious of my clientele and the people who are going to come and view this m narration of mine, this view, this movie. Well, that's got to be tough on you emotionally as well too. When, sure. when you feel like maybe you're just not being appreciated or maybe your art's just not selling to certain clientele. But it's kind of like being an actor too, right? You might audition for something, but it might not just be what they're looking for. Yeah, that's right. Right? Yeah, try not to take things so personally. Mm -hmm. Like you do it because you just love it. Yeah, and obviously you do. Yeah. So when you think about your kids, that's got to be some inspiration too because you've got a beautiful family and it's fairly diverse because you've got a, a, you know, a son who's got some struggles, yeah. right? Tell me a bit about that. Um, he has a syndrome, it's called Soto Syndrome, and uh, we've been going through uh, uh, the ups and downs of, of the syndrome, but he's, uh, he, he's a strong young man, mm -hmm. and uh, he's inspired me. Uh, just, just watching him, how he's got over things, it just made me a stronger man. Well, I've met him, and he's incredibly polite. He's and very he's polite. Very generous. Manners uh, maketh a man. Yeah, well, there you go. Yeah. And he, uh, he's such a nice kid, and he's kind of like you in that sort of way, where he's got this flair of just, you know, focusing on, on just being a good guy. Right? Yeah. So when you're doing things around Barry, what do you think Barry could do to see more of your art? How would you want to get your art around Barry more? Uh, I think more shows, just more, more, more exposure. I think there's like these little pockets of art, but it just needs to be more, uh, more available. So like uh, most people have this idea of when they go into a gallery, there's just the posh or the elitist. But art is meant to be for the people. Like all through history, it was for the people. So strictly, mm -hmm. you're going to participate to be a part of something. Yeah. But now, everybody, uh, it's just, it's just changed. Not everybody gets to be a successful artist either. Mm -hmm. There's that whole struggle with the starving part. Like, what do you do when you're when you're not painting? Like, there or not necessarily like your hobbies and stuff. But what do you do to try and ramp it back up again when things are slow? Like for a month or a year. Uh, read constantly. Read constantly. Read or get my. Uh, even when I'm not painting, I'm painting in my mind. So you're constantly creating, or just even doing a thumbnail sketch, or it's funny just looking at things differently. Like I said about the snowbank, you, you, if you look at a snowbank and you'll see mountains and rivers and mm -hmm. just trying to keep that open. There was another technique I practice all the time that Leonardo da Vinci came up with. It's like you look at a tile, just looking at a little, like a stain on a wall, yeah. and what do you see? It's like looking at the clouds when you're a kid. What do you? What do you see? Yeah. And if you keep that going, sooner or later something will pop in your head like, oh, I, gotta, I have an idea and just work that. Mm -hmm. Your comment about the, the snowbank, that was something we said off camera where uh, we were talking about a painting that, I've, that I have of yours yeah. where um, you would put your fist into a snowbank yeah. and it sort of inspired this creativity of this. I was just trying to give some relevance to that. Yeah. So when you're painting, do you find that there are moments where you're painting where you get caught up in your painting and you just can't stop or well, that the yeah. emotion gets in there too? And That's the best time when you actually, it's funny, when you start falling into a painting, you become, you, you almost, it's like an, a window to another world. Mm -hmm. You'll just fall into it and you almost feel like you can reach your hand into it. Yeah. It's rare at times as a painter, a lot of times you're just painting the surface and want something done. Mm -hmm. But when you do love a painting or a piece of art that you're creating, it's, uh, uh, most wonderful experience to be able to fall into something and go into the world that you've created. It's kind of like when I, when I think about when I was a kid or I see kids who draw. Some kids draw because they're told to. Here, draw an apple, fine, I'll draw an apple. Sure. Here, draw a dragon, quick, I'll, and they sketch it out. But I find that there's those moments where kids, and even adults, I've done it myself, where I'll draw something, yeah. and if I'm drawing or my kids are drawing, and I'm sure you do this too, 
you start speaking in the voice of whatever you're drawing. Oh no! Or you, or you yeah. start to go, I'm going to slay yeah. you, yeah. and that and that sort of stuff gets you into the picture. And I think sure. that's kind of like you being drawn in. Yeah, I yeah. always like even right now, like I make props and things like that to get like I have like little helmets and things like that to fall into whatever I'm creating. So yeah, you've got well, shields and swords and body parts. Yeah, and, and they're all and all the these skeletons and that's stuff right. around here that are just rich. little things to just inspire to inspire even rocks. I collect rocks just to kind of because you can see a landscape on top of a rock. All of a sudden, you just imagine little trees that are embedded on top and then create the other and the rest. So what's it like when you tell somebody, like, so you meet your wife, yeah. right? And so you tell her you're an artist. Sure. You know, on a Match.com profile, that may not help a whole no. lot because they're hoping for lawyers and doctors, and you're that's an artist. Right. Yeah, here comes oh, a starving artist. Great. Yeah, sure. Great. What restaurant does he work in? Yeah, that's right. right. So you're an artist, a successful, true, talented artist. What's it like for you and your wife? What's it like, because uh, I know she inspires you too. Yeah, she was, uh, when I first met her, she was really uh, intrigued. Well, I remember meeting her and I had my art portfolio and what's that? And she went over my stuff and I think right there I got her hook, line and sinker. So yeah, yeah she fell in love and I fell in love obviously and then uh, we got married and, and then she became a huge uh, thing for me, uh, just create, doing paintings of her. I had a whole line for the States. I did uh, about three years of just people buying paintings of just of my wife. And so she's your muse and your She was my pictures. muse, yes. Now this kills me, because you told me the story too off camera and I, and I want you to share it. So you're telling me about how you were painting all these paintings and people That's love right. the romance. Yeah. Kind of like the Gustav Klimt and Helen sort of comp, you know, uh, comparison, right? Yeah. So here you are painting and you've got these paintings of your wife. Yeah. And then all of a sudden you decided to do what? To mix it up. Uh, I thought at the time I would change up uh, hairstyles because I thought I was doing multiple paintings almost like of the same scene. I thought maybe I'll just change up the hair color a little bit. So I remember I painted, I put a black wig on her and uh, the, the, the paintings were fine. <laughs> It just but when they went to the clientele, everybody thought I was having uh, relations with someone else. So and then everybody was wondering, oh, what's, what happened with John's marriage? So in the end, I had to take the paintings, actually ship back, change them all, and buy them back, and everything was all everything's all fine. everything went back to normal. Yeah, I'm just gonna paint yeah. the hair back yeah. over. Yeah, that's the right. The joys of oil paint. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> so what's that like for you to know that you've got this very delicate sort of following too? Because there is. Like, let's be honest, uh, music uh, and art uh, and food, those are some of the most romantic things people can, can embrace. That's right. So what's it like for you knowing that you've got this following and, and how do you, do you aim to please them or do you just keep painting or do you wind up, you know, doing a lot of uh, mass production stuff now? Now, I, 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 now I'm going to paint strictly for, for me and what I really, really enjoy. I, I learned a lot doing in, uh, in, in that field, dealing with an agent and things like that. But I found that I was starting to lose myself, so I needed to take a, a, a mental break. Mm -hmm. So now I kind of want to tell stories that I want to tell. And uh, I'd rather take my time and not sell out. Mm -hmm. And I hate that term, sell out. It, it, if it, putting bread on the table is, you know, you do what it's you need providing. to do. It's providing. So even Michelangelo, he hated doing the Sistine ceiling. He hated doing it. But the fact he said, all right, how much is this job going to be? And uh, backbreaking. yeah, it was backbreaking, but he did it. Yeah. So and you do it, like I said, you do what you got to do to provide. See, I see a painting like your Job, for example, that yeah. just again melted me emotionally, and that was just incredible. You've got these paintings, for example, you got recognized in Europe. Yeah. For for what? What was the painting, and what was the accolade you got from it? Uh, basically, it was a, a art renewal competition. It was uh, I I painted uh, Sisyphus, and. Uh, I never thought even, I've always been one of those hidden guys. I never re even like to really go out and expose myself as an artist that much. Yeah. I'm very quiet. So what's that, the story of Sisyphus, just sort of in a short term? What is the story of him? And the story of Sisyphus is that he was a gossiper of Zeus, and Zeus cursed him to carry the rock up and down the mountain for eternity. So the rock oh. goes up, down it goes. And at the time, I felt I'm carrying this rock. Mm -hmm. And you, you go through hardships of life. But I changed the story in my painting a little bit by adding if uh, the painting has a little bit of a sunset, mm -hmm. I didn't want it to be a, that this is it. There had to be something that there's a little bit of hope. He's another got a little day. bit of hope another that day. there's another day coming. Yeah. Maybe you'll be able to plant that thing on top, and hopefully I'll be able to plant my my rock as an artist on top of my mountain. Mm -hmm. And so the accolades you got for this were not just something small. This no, was a big deal. It, yeah, it meant a lot to I Like like I said, I. So what I've, was the award? Uh, for the art, art renewal, for uh, I came in uh, uh, top finalist for fantasy uh, and uh, uh, classical realism. Mm -hmm. So 
but w it was my wife that inspired. She's the one who actually pitched for, for me to do it. So she got the photos all developed and sent it out. And I didn't even really think I was going to get in. And then when I got the letter saying, You're, you've made it, and they were wondering, who are you? From they, Barrie, Ontario. From Barrie, Ontario. <laughs> so lots of talent around town. It's just a matter of us all getting together. Through history, there's always these little pockets of people that would get together and change. And you had the Impressionists, say the Renaissance, even with music, musicians. It's just a matter of us finding each other and coming together and then just brainstorming and yeah. motivating each other. Well, we have some artists around town. Like a, I have friends who are incredible First Nations inspired artists. Yeah. And there's a, a friend of mine here in town and she does flowers. Yeah. And I mean flowers six feet by six feet that you see them and you're just like, are you sure it's not a photograph? Yeah. Like it's that good. And that's why when I look at your stuff too, I just see this. I love that there's a, a whole crazy cross section. Barry really has some incredible talent. And I love that, again, people are getting to know you today. So you've also been recognized too as one of the top Renaissance artists of our time. Well, I, I, I don't like the toot, but just uh, I, I, I believe in my product. I believe in what I'm doing. Yeah, but you did get that accolade, right? You did have somebody who recognized you. As well, that. like I said, for the, art, for the art renewal competition, that, uh, it meant a lot to me. And uh, like, it, it was just one of those things that I, I was recognized through my peers, because some of these people were top painters in the world, and mm -hmm. uh, I really respect them, and they viewed my work, and I was able to get that award. Well, when you were talking about your Sisyphus, we were talking a little bit about um, the struggles, yeah. right? And we only touched on it briefly, but you've had your own struggles that keep you either, you know, they might have pulled you down at one time and maybe just tell you to just pack it in or maybe sure. not paint or give up on family or your life or love or whatever. What sort of struggles have you had that, again, the, the best benefit is that it's come around and made you an incredible artist, but what have been some of your struggles? What have you had to deal with? Well, my mine is my struggle is myself, like dealing with me, so mm -hmm. putting up with me, and uh, I know I have uh, some uh, ADD kicking in, but and uh, I never really realized what it was until uh, uh, even f uh, talking to people, and I'm able to concentrate on a painting for a long amount of time because I'm not, even though I'm sitting there, I'm not really sitting there. You're mentally traveling. There's always this movement in your mind, mm -hmm. and uh, this is the one thing that's helped. Anything else, I I really struggled with having uh, ADD. Mm -hmm. So what reels you back in? What keeps you focused other than painting? What do you My think? wife, yeah. my wife and children. Um, I think age is uh, just another thing. It's just it's able to keep me focused. And I, I believe in uh, perspiration over inspiration. I believe in working hard and then constantly staying in it because sooner or later something will just emerge. Mm -hmm. So what do you find then that you find yourself doing when you're not painting? Uh, meditation, going for walks, spending time watching the kids. Yeah. Um, definitely always looking at art. I'm always working and looking at art or researching or even just practicing. I have books and books of me just practicing drawing. Yeah, I've seen some of your books where you've gone through just yeah. trying to do a repetitive That's pattern. That's my OCD, try but yeah. Yeah. So let's say you go to a restaurant and they've got crayons on the table and all the paper. Do you find yourself all of a sudden sketching out something amazing and people are like, what the heck are you drawing? Why aren't you drawing happy faces and stick people? I, I mainly just try and let, let participate with the kids and just we fence with the crayons and we just kind of, in the end, there's a nice cute little drawing. I always imagine what it'd be like to have you sit down at a table and somebody comes back and all of a sudden there's like this. Neoclassical drawings all over the place. And like, ooh, it's a, who's this guy? Hello, I'm your server. Yeah. What is that? <laughs> yeah. So what do you do just for you? Do you, you were talking about boating earlier and stuff like that when we were off camera. Yeah. What's your, uh, where do you go just to be, you know, John? Uh, mainly, uh, I go for walks in the forest a lot. Um, mainly just being present. I'm trying to stay still. It's trying, I, I enjoy just anywhere. Just going for walks. Um, definitely listen to music. Uh, my house is the party house all the time. We do karaoke and things like that. Yeah. Just letting loose. Yeah, just I've be silly. Don't take yourself so serious. I've come over and the first thing you're like, hey, yeah, want to sing something? Yeah, I want to do some karaoke. No, I'll have a yeah. coffee and you can <laughs> sing. I'll be over here. Knock That's it. Out. Yeah. So when you're, when you're thinking about what's next for you, yep. clearly you've got work in progress. Yes. You have other things that you want to do. You're um, currently seeking other things too. Like you've been, you've had people ask you to do hotels and whatever yeah. else too, right? What's that like? How do they approach you? Uh, usually it's through an agent, and then uh, um, we were going to do a, a riverboat casino, but uh, that was all funding, and it's just a matter of going through the agents will present it to me. I really never really go looking. Once you're with an agent, you're signed exclusivity, mm -hmm. so that's their job to find the clientele I basically just produce. Yeah, so they can send you here, we want a pineapple, or we want yeah, a bunch exactly. of really nice landscapes. And I enjoyed it because it, it was one of those things that I could stay behind the scenes. I didn't want to be a part of, uh, I didn't want to go in for the negotiation. Um, 
it, it, that, that's how y'all basically always says work is the agents would always be out there f looking for it. Mm -hmm. So I, I would just be at home creating. And that was, that's my job. I'm, I'm the one to create it. I don't want to go out and start pitching it all the time. Well, do you find that there's a trend coming back around? Because I know that I'm seeing in Huge. galleries right now, people are back to the whole uh, impressionist style. They've got Group of Seven. They've Huge. got Monet, Manet, all these incredible styles of, of the old days that are all coming back in again. Like when I look at your, your art up here on the wall, I think, well, maybe in the 90s that wouldn't have done so well, but now people love that again because of things like Game of Thrones or they yeah. get these stories in their head and that's what they think of. Yeah, you just got to really love, love what you do. Right now, there, there's a huge movement coming in. Canada's still, you know, remember through history, we're still a, such a young country. So mm -hmm. Europe had its time where you had, you know, a long time, a period where all these great artists emerged like this. But right now there's a, 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 a movement coming. It's just a matter of, like I said, even within Barry, there could be, it's just a matter of us getting together and picking each other's brains mm -hmm. and then motivating one another. But if you're trying to be like, uh, no man's an island, for me to be sitting at home and just creating, I have to get out there and be with other people and be inspired by others. But it allows you to grow. It does allow you to grow because certain things, you'll just have certain information that I just happen to need at that time and then we just exchange information on techniques. Yeah, well books will teach so much, but then there's the hands-on and then it's always good to meet somebody who's kind of done what you need to, That's right. to do. That's right, yeah. So what's next for John? Like when you're, when you're not being a painter, you are, you know, you're meditating, you're taking your walks in the woods, but you must have something else on the go. I know that you were talking about doing some work with seniors. Yeah, right, uh, I'm looking into doing some uh, Painting with seniors you know, for uh, who have uh, dementia, dementia patients. Um, You've been doing it, not just into it. So yeah, 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 that's right. So I've been working on doing landscapes. So I'd go down and spend about four hours with uh, each client, and uh, we would start doing an ink blot, and then slowly we'd just start create these little eight by tens of little landscapes. And uh, it would be a four-hour session, and it's wonderful to to witness them come come and actually start to paint with me. So and we would just at first we just kind of I would guide the painter, and then. Yeah, you don't just throw a brush in their hand and say, go for it, and you paint beside no. them and make them feel bad. No. You are going to paint together. I'll work. Yeah, we do it together. So what do you find is, is, what's it like for you, obviously rewarding, but what do you think it's like for you and the client, we'll call them clients, right, the other artist that is working to, you know, pull through some dementia or at least just have a moment of something. Some right? clarity. So just a moment of clarity for them and... Just uh, and to witness that it's a, a great feeling. I love painting, but then to see that with another human being, that art brought them out of suffering for a moment to create something. Mm -hmm. And uh, instead of just what could I hang over my couch? So, so what's that like for you then when you see a senior who is disappearing? What do you use to to draw them back? What do you what do you find as a tool that you might use to to you know bring them back to want to paint or you know to maybe find that lost moment from their life? Well, I basically start talking to them and then doing almost like a, a Warshak ink blot test and mm -hmm. then slowly kind of letting them see and what comes forth. Mm -hmm. So, and then slowly they'll just kind of, oh, I see this and then I'll guide them. And then we'll just try and stay on that thought for a little bit and then create more and more. Mm -hmm. And by the time we're done, we have a really nice little painting and I frame it up for them. Yeah. And, yeah, and I give it to their, their family members. You had mentioned to me off camera too that you had talked about how sometimes you'll bring in certain things from that era where maybe they were growing up. You'll bring in like a cool old flower maker or like a cool old wooden spoons or things like that. Yeah, anything. What sort of things do you find are cool tools to help people bring back to where they were? Uh, mainly just talking, just dialogue and pulling things out and asking them like, what do you remember? And then slowly, a lot of times it's just, just little tiny things that will trigger. What do you remember? Or like I said, if we do the Warshak, they'll see something that I, will, I won't see and that will trigger something and we'll be able to start to create. Well, as a father, Clearly, you're going to want to be remembered in your life as being a good father and a good That's husband. That's right. But what do you want to be remembered for as an artist? Uh, just to make my mark to actually, uh, m my biggest goal is to motivate another artist in the future. When it's time for someone to open up a book and maybe they'll see what I've done or maybe not, it would be nice to see. I'd like to maybe follow in that direction and hopefully I can give them some guidance that way through now or through history and hopefully I've left something for them to be inspired by. Well, I like that you are a true artist and not in a competitive way where you wouldn't want to inspire other people. Give me one inspirational thing that you think other artists should use or, or feel to get inspired and keep going, not ever give up. Uh, basically, just stay in the trenches. Always keep searching, keep drawing. Yeah. I can't stress drawing enough. And then uh, if, you're not, if you don't have access or maybe you're limited with the tools, but just keep creating in your mind. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, it's, uh, don't give up. Don't give up. 
That's a great message. Yeah. Thank you, John, for taking the time today. Thank you. Again, thank you for everything. For sure. Thank you. Continue. Appreciate success. it.